Hey, it's Professor Dave. Let's learn about pharmaceuticals. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave explains. We all get sick from time to time, whether it's just a cold or something more serious. And there's great controversy amongst the public about how to treat disease. Some argue that conventional medicine is best suited to address the health needs of the human body, while others are skeptical, avoiding the entire system in favor of some kind of alternative. But before anyone discredits Western medicine, they must understand that all disease has a molecular basis, whether the cause is bacterial infection, a genetic mutation, or anything else, any proposed treatment that does not address this fundamental cause for the disease is very unlikely to have any merit. So let's examine a few types of diseases and the methods that science has come up with to combat them, which we can refer to as drugs. One category of disease is genetic disorder. These can be hereditary, passed down from parent to offspring, or they can be the result of a mutation sustained during a person's lifetime. These will always involve some change to DNA that affects the product of gene expression, resulting in a protein with behavior that deviates from what is normal. If we need to shut down a particular biochemical process that has gone awry, one solution that we have stumbled upon in science is the concept of an inhibitor. We know that there are enzymes and receptors that mediate so much of what goes on in the cell, and sometimes we may need to silence one of these. An inhibitor is a molecule that will fit into the active site of, say, an enzyme, and bind either reversibly through electrostatic interactions or more permanently through covalent bonds, such that the normal substrate is unable to enter. This kind of inhibition, called competitive inhibition, prevents the substrate from coordinating and therefore also prevents the enzyme from performing its function. There is also non-competitive inhibition, where a compound binds to the enzyme in some other location and causes a conformational change that decreases the active site's affinity for the substrate. This also disrupts enzymatic function. Many poisons work this way and are dangerous because of the important cellular processes they inhibit. But when an irregular cellular process is doing harm to the organism, an inhibitor can stop this activity. Inhibitors are therefore a huge part of the pharmaceutical industry. We have to recognize that if a disease, such as some form of cancer, is the direct result of a genetic mutation and results in either a misbehaving or non-functional protein, then that is the fundamental cause of the disease. Any potential solution or cure must specifically address that cause by somehow inhibiting the expression of that gene, inhibiting the resulting protein, or some other similar biochemical strategy. When the cause is this specific, there is nothing about diet or exercise that can have any impact whatsoever, since your general health, as important as it is, is not linked to the highly specific origin of such a disease. That's why skepticism towards the pharmaceutical industry, which can certainly be legitimate from a social or economic standpoint, if misplaced onto the science itself, can have disastrous consequences on the health of an individual or an entire population. Another application for inhibitors can be found in the domain of mental health. We learned about neurotransmitters, and it is the case that molecules like serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine will dictate your mood by transmitting signals through the synaptic cleft. If these neurotransmitters exist in insufficient concentrations, it can lead to depression. One solution to this problem is to use a reuptake inhibitor. This is a molecule that blocks the receptors that reabsorb some of the neurotransmitter molecules, which results in a greater concentration of neurotransmitters in the synaptic space, and therefore more effective transmission. Once again, the fundamental cause of the problem is that not enough of a particular molecule is being transmitted. So a drug that addresses that problem by increasing the transmission of that molecule one way or another is going to be best suited for solving that issue. 
In this way, those who criticize antidepressants as being merely a chemical solution to a deeper problem are not fully aware of the specific chemical nature of the problem in the first place. This does not mean psychotropic drugs are the solution for every mental health issue, but they can be very successful for certain people. Some diseases are the result of some kind of deficiency in an essential vitamin or mineral. Take vitamin C, for example. As we now understand, this molecule, also called L-ascorbic acid, acts as a coenzyme in certain enzymatic pathways, such as collagen synthesis. Collagen, a structural protein present in connective tissue, is the most abundant protein in the human body. And vitamin C is needed to activate the enzyme that performs one of the steps in synthesizing collagen. If we do not consume enough vitamin C, collagen synthesis is impaired and we get scurvy, like a pirate on the high seas. The reason this would happen is that vitamin C is predominantly found in fruits and vegetables, and these tend to spoil during a long journey. A vitamin is therefore just a molecule that we need to ingest for proper cellular function because we can no longer synthesize it ourselves, as the ability was lost somewhere over the course of biological evolution. But plants still make all these nutrients, so as long as we eat the plants, we will be just fine. The amazing feat of modern chemistry is to recognize the link between a disease like scurvy and a molecule like ascorbic acid, and furthermore, to know the structure of this molecule such that we can build it ourselves and offer it in the form of supplements to those who do not have access to the whole foods that contain them. Contrary to popular belief, there can be absolutely no difference between a molecule of ascorbic acid found in a fruit and one made in a lab, because they are identical arrangements of precisely the same atoms. It is the shape of a molecule that causes its bioactivity, not its source. Another category of disease is the pathogenic. A pathogen is any microorganism that can cause disease, like bacteria or viruses. Most bacteria are harmless or even beneficial to the human body, but there are some that cause infectious diseases like tuberculosis or pneumonia. It was not that long ago that we were completely unaware that these organisms even existed. But once we realized that they were responsible for certain diseases, our studies of these organisms led to the invention of antibiotics, which can kill certain bacteria. Many of these operate on the basis of a difference between bacterial cell structure and human cell structure. Bacterial cells possess a cell wall made of a substance called peptidoglycan, which human cells do not possess. The first antibiotic ever discovered, penicillin, inhibits a bacterial enzyme that is used to regenerate the cell wall. So in the presence of the drug, the cell wall of bacterial cells will rupture, spilling their contents and thus killing the bacteria. Antibiotics like penicillin and others that followed have almost single-handedly doubled the human lifespan. Viruses, however, have different structures and mechanisms of survival from bacterial cells, as viruses are not cells at all. They are much tinier and operate by inserting their genetic material into a host cell, hijacking the cellular machinery and forcing it to generate more viruses, while typically destroying the cell in the process. Thus, antibiotics do not work on viruses. Instead, vaccines have proven effective in training the human body to prepare a response to certain types of viruses by introducing a piece of the virus so that the immune system can recognize and remember it for optimal future response. This is how we have largely eradicated many diseases like smallpox, polio, and measles. However, again, skepticism of vaccination threatens to facilitate the return of some of these diseases. For other viruses, a more complex approach is required, but any legitimate antiviral drug will disarm some biochemical process that the virus relies on. For example, in order to invade a host cell, receptors on the virus must recognize certain receptors on the cell. If inhibitors are introduced that block either of these receptors, the virus will not be able to enter and reproduce. Other drugs can inhibit the transcription of viral DNA once it is inside the cell. 
and ribozymes are specially designed enzymes that can target viral DNA and chop it up so it can't be transcribed. Whatever the case may be, any legitimate treatment must be preceded by a sophisticated knowledge of the biochemistry involved. By contrast, some diseases are strictly physiological, like many forms of cardiovascular disease. These involve the heart or blood vessels and can occur because of poor diet, lack of exercise, or other lifestyle factors. These are the ones in which a holistic approach to general health can be effective in preventing. But there are also medications that offer some assistance. All of these systems will be covered in greater detail in the upcoming biology series. So we must understand that in order to treat a disease, it is imperative that we understand how it operates on the cellular and molecular level, and then come up with a strategy that addresses some detail on one of these levels. That is the approach of pharmaceutical drugs, which are specially designed molecules that can inhibit specific biochemical processes. This allows us to eliminate pathogens, silence mutant enzymes, and more. If by blind chance an ancient tradition has discovered a food or plant that has legitimate medicinal properties, which is certainly possible since humans have been curious and bold enough to try things far before we understood chemistry, that substance has those medicinal properties because it contains an active ingredient, some molecule inside it that performs a biochemical function similar to the strategies we have discussed, not because the plant as a whole is sacred or magic. Everything in your body is made of molecules, and every biological process involves the interaction of those molecules. Unfortunately, most people do not have a background in chemistry and biochemistry, so when trying to make assessments about health and medical treatment, they must simply go by what they have heard. But there is a lot of misinformation out there, whether it is genuine misunderstanding or deliberate manipulation for financial gain. A vilification of Western medicine is a popular meme that leads people away from legitimate medical treatment as they instead opt for alternative medicines with no real impact other than a placebo effect, which can be enough to cure your headache but will never cure your cancer. Luckily, as you continue to build your understanding of science, you won't be so easily manipulated. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials, and as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.